Okay. Hey, welcome everyone to Live Shot Podcast. Today I'm excited to introduce to you Sean Johnson. He's an ex professional athlete who overcame a career threatening injury with um, alternative treatments. And he has also got ex uh, personal experience of how holistic approaches to healthcare can provide benefit to people. Um, he's a natural therapist clinician helping a broad demographic of humans understand and navigate various modern lifestyle ailments by combining different therapeutic approaches to healthcare. And Sean's got a BA degree in psychology and anthropology, which I think is interesting, uh, and honors in psychology for applied context, as well as various other natural therapeutic qualifications. Sean, it's so good to have you on the show. Clint, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, man, no, no, no problem. And I, I saw your profile on Instagram and we were actually introduced by Liz, who's been a guest on our show as well. Okay. And, um, what was interesting to me is that she mentioned, as I mentioned to her that I get, I got, um, jaw tension. And in fact, I've been to a specialist dentist last week and they're going to do a bit of treatment on, uh, my jaw here. I'm going to have mm -hmm. one of these, um, Michelin braces put in on next Friday, um, just to see how that helps with alignment. And then, <clears throat> uh, the thing about straightening my teeth. So, that, that kind of thing. But I see that you also work with people with, um, I suppose, all types of ailments in the body. I mean, what sure. is it specifically around the face that, that you help people with? Well, uh, you know, to, to sort of give you the, uh, let's telescope out of it. Yeah. The, the dura mater is the sort of outer layer, the outer protective covering of the brain and spinal cord. And it has very specific attachments in the body. So, uh, at the base of your spine, it attaches onto the sacrum and the coccyx. And then right up at the very top, it attaches on the upper cervical spine and the sphenoid bone. Um, a lot of people don't know much about the sphenoid bone simply because it's, it's inside your skull. You, you know, you're not really aware of it. But um, to, to sort of get to the sphenoid bone and manipulate it, you actually have to go through the jaw. And um, really, you know, the, the brain uses the jaw to navigate you through a gravitational field. So generally, we have problems in our jaw and sphenoid area. And then we develop shoulder pain, knee pain, back pain, neck pain, headaches, tinnitus, hormonal issues. The list is endless. And so uh, in my clinic, uh, you know, focusing on these dual attachment sites uh, brings benefit to people. And I'd say, I don't know, maybe... Maybe three out of four, the predominant issue is in the upper dural attachment site, so your jaw. Uh, so uh, dysfunction tends to be descending. So even your you know, medial knee pain can be traced back to you know, what's going on in the TMJ. Really? Um, the, you know, in, in this area of the body, you have what's called a, a trigeminal nerve. And um, it's the one that becomes compromised when um, our, our jaw is, is misaligned. And it, um, the moment it becomes irritated or compromised, the brain produces a neurotransmitter called substance P. Now, it's a, it's a pain uh, sort of uh, alerter in the body. It's a neurotransmitter that uh, obviously increases pain levels. Uh, but also it moduli, moduli, modulates uh, <laughs> cytokines in the body. Yeah. So when your jaw is irritated, you have a systemic inflammatory response throughout the body. So... It doesn't matter that you have knee pain. It can often be traced back to the jaw, you know? So mm. in clinic, sort of getting this part of the body right first before we look at, uh, you know, the periphery and, and sort of other stuff. I'm, I'm looking for root cause dysfunction, and that's often upper, upper cervicals and, uh, you know, upper um, dural attachments. So let's say um, when I went to the dentist, she, she said, held my mm. jaw like this, and then as I mm. open, it kind of does like a, an edge. Sure. When I open and close. <laughs> yes, know, yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of a lot of people's do. A lot of people's do. <clears throat> Does that so what would you be able to do? Let's say I came to your clinic. <clears throat> um would you first start like if I said to you, okay, hey, Sean, I can't I've got a bit of tension here. What can you do for me? What would you do then? Well, there's a couple of things. Uh one is we assess, first of all. Because believe it or not, if you that one in four person where the, the problem's ascending your jaw problem might be coming from your coccyx. So, really? So uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, people come for, uh, like into clinic for migraine treatment and they must wonder what, what I'm, you know, assessing the coccyx and, and trying to straighten it out. But, <laughs> They'll be uh, like, what are you doing down there, man? Come on. It's up yeah, to you. <laughs> exactly. 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 So I'm always, 
uh, you know, a part of my intake is I explain to people I treat holistically. I'm looking for root cause dysfunction. I'm not treating symptoms. So hmm. yes, your elbow hurts, you know, 90, 90% of the time, it's not your elbow. It's, it's coming from somewhere else. Yeah. So definitely assess. And then, uh, you know, we just have a look at where, where you are carrying that tension. So it hmm. can be lateral pterygoids. It can be temporalis, uh, the masseter, um, you know, uh, C, C1 and 2, so the atlas and axis, these are the top two cervical uh, vertebra. They have uh, they share a real special relationship with the sphenoid because they're actually connected with connective tissue. So sometimes your jaw stuff can actually be the neck, those two vertebra. Um, in a large majority of cases, you know, if you've got neck pain, it's, it's actually the sphenoid or the jaw that's out. Jeez. But um, again, if you just assess, you can kind of figure out what's going on and um, sort of straighten that out. I know that's, I hate using that word because I'm, I'm not a chiropractor, so I don't click things into position. But uh, uh, really what I'm doing is, is adjusting the dural tension. Uh, I'm, mm. I'm playing with the tensegrity in the body. And so if you can create a, a even dural tone, uh, so you have um, even tension states either side of the body, then you, know, you operate pretty much pain-free. Uh, in most cases, please. So, I mean, from a, a rugby player, you you think uh, who, you played prop, didn't you? It looks like you played prop in some of your photos. I, d- I did, yes, uh, for my sins. <laughs> yeah, and, you, and I suppose it's a bit stereotypical. Like you, you speaking all these big words are kind of like, wow, that's amazing, man. Uh, you know so much stuff, and you're like a rugby player. So. Tell us a bit well, about your story. Here. <laughs> <laughs> my, my joke was, so I, you know, uh, if people aren't familiar with the rugby, uh, I, my position, I played one or three. So I had the number one on the back or number three on my back. And I always used to say to people, look, just because I weigh one and three doesn't mean my IQ is one and three. Because that's the, you know, the sort of the perception of rugby players. Yeah, for sure. Mm. So tell us about this. Uh, it looks like you had an episode with, um, we've got to talk about the hair. <laughs> tell, us, tell us about the hair and if the listeners want to see it they go to um, uh, structuralmedicine.ca.za look at my story and read about uh, Sean there so, so tell us about that Sean well <laughs> so uh, how old was I? I don't know about 21 I started growing my hair mm. and um, I'd always wanted dreadlocks you know it was uh, in a time this was early 2000 so in a time when dreadlocks weren't as sort of fashionable and as accepted as what they are now mm. but i had them yeah for about uh eight years i think i cut them when i was 29 i just had enough um but they got fairly long um <laughs> and uh yeah you know i got married and had kids and my head looks like this now so um it is what it is <laughs> <laughs> awesome so okay so structural medicine helps mm. uncover attitudes and unconscious beliefs that contribute to a, to a, so, or limits, sorry, postural integrity. So it contributes or limits postural integrity. And I thought that'd be, that's quite interesting. And, and it also either contributes or, or limits efficient movement dynamics. So my question mm-hmm. is this, right? So there, there seems to be, and just correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, the connection between our beliefs potentially or, or our attitudes and our physical ailment. Is that true? Mm. I'm assuming that, that right. hundred um, percent. You know, th- this is my, my belief in clinic. You can see someone walking down the street that is feeling a particular way that they, you know, they hunched, they closed off. Okay. That, that, that posture is being expressed. Uh, that subconscious belief is being expressed through the nervous system. And so uh, often I'd say, Again, and this is, you know, you know figures, figures are always made up. Mm-hmm. But I'd say about 80% of what I treat are more, because you get three types of stresses on the nervous mm-hmm. system, right? So you get physical stress, you know, that is a, you know, you have too much wine and you fall down the stairs. You know, that's a physical injury. Yeah. Uh, sitting 12 hours a day behind a laptop and you develop lower back pain. These are all sort of physical stresses on the body. Mm-hmm. Um, you get chemical. So, you know, you can incorporate hormones into that, hormonal stresses, uh, you know, uh, too much uh, cell phone radiation, electromagnetic radiation, uh, exposure to toxins in the air, exposure to, uh, you know, things we eat in our food. And then a large majority, then you also get emotional stress. Mm. Um, And this is generally, and I mean, especially with what's going on in the world at the moment, um, these these affect, these cause uh, pain symptoms in the body. 
Mm. And it's, it's because of, you know, I spoke about earlier about the dura mater. It's, it's a highly sensitive piece of tissue. Uh, it connects in with all the, all the fascia of the body. And, you know, in Chinese medicine, it's called the governing vessel for good reason, because it governs all other systems of yin and yang. That's what the literature says in the body. Mm. So, you know, when we think about this, when you're stressed, what's the first thing that happens? We pull our shoulders up. Mm. We have this unconscious need to protect ourselves. We're actually trying to curl ourselves into a ball. Um, if you look at um, uh, earthworms or snakes or worms, when they feel threatened, they'll curl into a ball. It's a protective Cool. spasm we we have the same reflex we've got the same sort of dna and structure it's just we don't we remain upright but our posture becomes compromised in the process so uh, a lot of times really what i'm treating is stress on the nervous system so you know when i started this work i don't know about 15 years ago that was totally not accepted it just couldn't be done but now you know the way the world is going it's it's more accepted people understand the concept that um, my thought processes, my emotions, my thinking all influence uh, me as an organism, as a bio entity. So um, definitely, you know, your back pain, your headaches, all of these can be stress related, some form of stress. So is there, I suppose there's a line that might be crossed when you think, all right, if I think positive, well, let's say you want to heal yourself mm. of something. So I know mm. the body's a good healer, right? So if you give it the right environment, you, you, you decrease the stress, maybe slow your heart rate down, you know, because I'm, I'm also into breathing techniques. Breathing, good, I good. Do, yeah. I do heart rate variability, uh, resonance breathing and such. And I know that when you do get into uh, good resonance breathing, you slow everything down, your body has a chance to heal. But mm. I think what, I, what I'm tr trying to ask maybe is, you know, when we spoke about maybe bad beliefs or bad attitudes can cause, a, mm. say, a dysfunction. Um, mm. let's say you had a dysfunction, you think, or I want to think positively and try to get better, but what if you don't? So there's probably like this misconception maybe that, you know, uh, just thinking positive is going to get you well, or is there no. some, some truth in or how do you, they link somehow, but they're not like totally like directly connected, are they? For sure. Um, again, you know, thinking, I, I think the biggest mistake people make is I must think positive. Yeah, because, you know, we, we live in this world of uh, dual opposites. And so we tend to we tend to gravitate to, to the good because that's, you know, what society expects of us. Mm. But our nervous system operates in homeostasis and that's perfect balance. And so when you constantly uh, take a nervous system that should be in homeostasis and you're trying to keep it in an extreme of uh, think positive of excessive training, of excessive slothness. So you're just lying on the couch the whole time. Mm. You, you know, you develop symptoms. Mm. So no, there are, there are always, um, uh, there are always exceptional cases where thinking positive isn't going to help. Mm. But, um, you know, if you, there's literature, I think one of the best books I've ever read is um, a book by uh, Dr. Gabor Mate. And I don't know if you know of him or read yeah, any of his stuff. He but talks about childhood traumas, doesn't he? That's it. That's it. And he, he wrote a book called uh, The Cost of Hidden Stress. Mm. And he, he says in there, you know, you have a cancer personality. You have a sort of um, a certain a attitude will develop uh, specific uh, deficiencies or, mm. uh, you know, neurological symptoms. So, um, you know, sometimes thinking positive uh, isn't the answer, mm -hmm. uh, but it sure makes a big difference. You know, you, yeah. you, you've got to you've got to understand there's good and bad. And, you know, it's mm -hmm. what I suppose what Jung would talk about the shadow self mm -hmm. these parts of ourself that we sort of stuff down and we don't want to acknowledge and accept. And uh, we're trying to live in the light uh, per se. Uh, and that it doesn't work, unfortunately. So thinking positive is maybe not you know, not, not the answer to everything. It's not a magic spell, but I do think that. No. Also, one thing I am at the moment convinced about is um, epigenetics and our effect mm. that we can have on the gene to express itself 100%. in a certain way. But that mm. to me is not just uh, thought patterns. It can be, but it's also environment. So, you know, 
Or yeah. you're living, are you living with mold in your house? Obviously, your genes are going to be <laughs> expressed in a certain way. If you're sure. constantly under stress, then your, your genes are going to be expressed in a certain way. So, again, I think it's probably looking at it, excuse the pun, but in that holistic way. Sure. Yeah. You see, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer of um, <sighs> mood follows action. Right. And so, uh, you know, um, meditation is great, but what I've come to understand is breath work works better because meditation can sometimes be a sort of intangible concept in your head. You know, you either using a mantra or a, a thought, you know, thought processes or counting or something, mm. whereas breath work is a tangible feeling that you can feel in your body that you can access immediately. Um, you know, I, I talk about, um, I, I lecture to corporates on sort of uh, decreasing stress in, in the workplace. And one of the things I say is um, we, we should be, if we were still living as hunter gatherers, we'd be sleeping on the earth. Uh, we'd be eating food that wasn't laced with, uh, you know, pesticides. We'd be eating things like organic meat. We'd be fasting. We'd be living in small tribes close together. Uh, we'd be waking with the sun, going to bed with the sunset. We'd be covering vast distances as persistence hunters. So we'd be working out all this tension that we would build up. And our stress levels would be acute. So we'd be very short, uh, short yeah. bursts of stress yeah. as opposed to chronic long-term stress. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and how do we live today? We, you know, we sit under fluorescent lights. We don't get any sunshine. We numb ourselves with TV, alcohol, drugs, food. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, we, we just, we have a very ancient nervous system that hasn't changed much in 200,000 years, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. we, we, we're forcing it into this lifestyle that that's just not happy. Right. And so totally, I, I don't think thinking happy thoughts can reverse that. You actually make, need to make physical changes. And so whether that's regular exercise, getting in touch with nature, you know, making sure that the water you drink is of a, a decent quality, you're eating yeah. organic fruits, you're limiting large amounts of meat, um, you know. Um, and, and so, yeah, totally. There's, there's a large portion, and my belief is it's not all thinking positive thoughts. You actually need to do physical things to create that change. So, so that'd be hard for the South African to hear that, uh, limit the meat that you put on the braai. Yeah, <laughs> but it is, and I think that's one of the reasons why we have one of the highest heart disease rates in the world. I tell you, um, when I I came back to to visit South Africa um, about three mm. years ago, and I went to see all my friends, and every night was a braai, like a barbecue. A for the UK listeners and the USA listeners, and we were just so much meat, 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 meat all the time. I'm like I got to the end of it, like I'm sick of meat now. <laughs> for sure, for sure. But I think that's just an excuse to open beer. To be very honest. Oh yeah. <laughs> so this leads me on to a question which i'm skipping around here but i also want to ask you some other stuff no but my sure. what do you think about my assumption that this is my assumption that i'm thinking in my head right that if yeah. we move well we eat well we sleep well we manage stress well and it's all be hard to do all in one go mm. um so we do all the things that so we we're eating well moving well sleeping well managing stress that we'll be able to move jump around, play football, wrestle when we're about 100 years old because our joints are going to be like in tip-top shape. What do you think about that? I, I would agree with that. I, I wouldn't maybe say 100 years old, um, but our body craves movement. We, we are designed for movement. We are designed to, um, you know, and this comes from sort of anthropological studies, but we were persistence hunters. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, we had spears and bows and knives, and we developed these things, but they not they were crude instruments. They weren't the instruments, you know, a bow like today that you can hunt from kilometers away from. Mm. Um, we, we needed to get close to whatever we were hunting. And obviously, if you've seen a buck or whatever on, you know, an open field, the moment you come close, they're just gone. We would never get close. But mm. what we used to do was actually chase them down because... Uh, buck or whatever can only regulate their body temperature when they aren't running they need to pant and so as long as they're running they can't pant so we would chase these animals down until they would kill over from heat exhaustion and then we could just you know easy kill and we would have food so we were designed to to chase uh you know large you know uh, whatever we were hunting and so i think if we if we carry that movement into old age uh, we don't age as much, you know, um, 
it's like anything, I, I suppose. Even, you know, when I did my, uh, I did a, my, in my honors in psychology, my research report was on what happens to the brain as we age. Mm-hmm. Um, and why we develop memory loss and why dementia and Alzheimer's and all of these types of things. Yeah. And the brain is very, uh, I'm sure you've heard the term is neuroplastic. Yeah. So it will wire and rewire neural networks. Mm. And as long as you're challenging the brain, you know, with crosswords, with continuing to read and challenge yourself and not sort of be stuck in your knowledge body that you've accumulated throughout your life, mm. um, your brain doesn't age. And our bodies, I would feel, are pretty much the same. Yes, you're not, you know, when you're 60, you're not going to be able to do what you did when you were 20. Mm. Um, for good reason. I think we'd all kill ourselves. Um, <laughs> but uh, that you, you definitely, you are 100% right. If you, if you look after your vehicle, it's going to go a lot further than, you know, yeah. what, um, what we've been told. Mm. So it's a bit like, um, well, I read one of your blogs i read two of your blogs actually i like the first one okay. um, where you spoke about earthing which i'm also keen on and mm. i was been going barefoot since last year say october so okay i awesome. get onto the earth as much as i can um <clears throat> so then also the one called polished turd which i like it i like it like yeah. the title so it's quite okay. funny so um the in that article i didn't read i just skimmed it because i you know uh, Sure, I get a lot of information, but one of the things that stood out was that um, you may look good, but you might be, you might, your body movement uh, ability might not be so cool. So it's more important to think about, am I functionally, am I functioning well, instead of how do I look? So, so do you think people are stuck on, on, on looks rather than, you know, longevity as it were, maybe, maybe that's, I I, I would say so. I I think our society is, is uh you know very in a shallow sense driven in that direction mm. um so yeah you know sometimes um you know our feet uh, and i'm sure you've done research if you've gone barefoot uh, our feet should be a lot wider than what mm. they they currently are and it's just our shoes kind of force our toes together and mm. we don't move like we should as a result uh so you know if you looked at uh you know, a barefoot runner's feet, someone who's been barefoot for many years, the feet aren't as attractive. And the toes as, go a little know, wider, don't they? They do. They splay yeah. because that's, that's how they should be, right? Mm. Um, you know, we might look at them and go, oh, my God, look at that guy's feet. But, you know, from a proprioception point of view, I can tell you now, he's never, at 80, he's not going to fall over and break a hip. Mm-hmm. We, you know, this is a large part of our sort of aging population and even sort of more younger people now where we susceptible to hip replacements and knee replacements, all of these things, because we, we just constantly wrap our feet up. Some people, you know, will never touch the earth because they're in, uh, you know, I would say tackies. I'm going to say trainers, yeah. so everyone yeah. in the UK understands, um, or in socks or, you know, they just, mm. they're not getting that. They're not absorbing those free electrons from the earth. So, mm. um, you know, uh, that's just talking sort of, from a foot point of view, but even if you look at um, a lot of dentistry nowadays is all about straightening the teeth. But if you don't sort the jaw out first, it's like building a house on, you know, on sand. It's not really going to get, get anywhere, but there's this obsession with straight teeth. Mm. And what you don't realize is teeth positioning gives you jaw position. And so whatever, wherever they move your teeth to your jaw will compensate and adjust to that. Yeah. And sometimes the compensation is dysfunctional and mm-hmm. you develop headaches, you develop hormonal issues, you know, all sorts of lower back pain, neck pain. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's sort of the obsession with looks as opposed to, well, you know, am I functionally, um, you know, optimized in this position? Yeah. I, when I, when I did go see the dentist, she asked me, so, because you can see in the literature on the website, they do speak about the holistic approach and stuff, but then also like, yeah, uh, get the best smile. So I said to her, look, I'm not interested in looking good. I don't mind having skew teeth, you know, mm. what I'm, what I mind is, is that this might be causing cortisol uh, and stress in my body because my jaw is not correct. So whatever you can do to get my jaw correct, then, then do that. But, yeah. um, so what do you think is, Cause, cause she has said like, you know, we'll sort of, you get the bite, find the right bite where it should be. 
and then move mm. the tube to the right place. Is that is that kind of what you would suggest, or how would I you would, do that? Well, if she said that and she can do that or him, whoever, yeah. uh, I would say that's, you know, that's, that's a good way to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, again, you don't want to build that house on, on quicksand. And then how, you do you, know, how would the, you sort it out without moving the tea? That's what I'm kind of intrigued about. Like if you did sort out the jaw, so if you, out structure, you know, change. Mm, if you, if you, uh, you know, because if you, you can actually widen your jaw, believe it or not. Mm. And, um, um, <sighs> You know, I don't want to <laughs> talk over other uh, talk over other people, but um, <laughs> but you can you can actually you know you can your face shape will change depending on having teeth removed, widening the jaw, mm. all of this stuff happens naturally. Um, but we you know we kind of interfere with modern modern sort of uh, mm. interventions, mm. and that it changes things. Um, you know, I, I use a method in clinic, uh, something called uh, optimal functional positioning. So I'll just put sticks in the mouth and then I use, you know, I, I line the jaw up before I use any sort of neural stimulus for the mm. brain to realize, okay, this is, you know, this is where my jaw should be. Mm. I don't, uh, obviously I'm not a dentist, so I don't play around with teeth, but, um, you know, often I see it all the time. People will come in and they've got shoulder pain and, you know, I'm feeling around the upper, upper cervicals and upper dural attachments and it's, they really tight. And I'll say, have you had any sort of dental work? And they're like, oh, I had a, I've had a root canal or I've had this pulled or I'm doing this, I'm doing that. Um, and it's, it, it changes, you know, the, the pain fibers in the trigeminal nerve, which uh, if the jaws misaligned will affect are a hundred times more sensitive Mm. than other pain fibers in your body. So um, the moment, and I mean, your, your bite can be out by three or four mils and you might not have symptoms, but it's constantly reinforcing the sympathetic state of the nervous system. So yeah. you're in this constant state of fight or flight mm. and you, you don't understand why you, you know, you're feeling this edgy the whole time. And it's, it's often, it's what's going on up here in, in, in the jaw, you know? So, um, yeah, look, a lot of modern dentists will create splints for you. Yeah. Um, you know, guys who understand uh, what's going on. Um, and, you know, you'll wear that for a bit. And that actually holds the jaw. So they'll find your optimal position and then just make you a, a bite plate or a, a guard, a, an appliance, they call it. And that will mm. that'll hold everything in place. Mm. Which I think I'm going to experiment with next week. So we'll see how that goes. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, I, was this the therapy that you got introduced to when you first heard your back in, in rugby and the mm. alternative therapy is it, was it called yeah. Bowen therapy or was it? Bowen therapy. Yeah. Is that uh, what you do now or is it slightly different? It's evolved. So the majority of what I do is Bowen therapy. Mm. Um, but obviously, you know, if you, it's like at varsity. I'm not sure what you studied, but you know, just because you've studied engineering 10 years later, you don't practice the same way as what you learned at varsity type thing. So, you know, there's this constant yeah. uh, evolution in, in your life. And so I incorporate other practices, but the majority of what I use is something called Bowen therapy. It actually comes from Australia. It was named after a guy, Tom Bowen. Mm -hmm. And he developed, he was a self-taught guy. He, he, you know, there's lots of um, uh, sort of rumors and tall stories of him and mm -hmm. things he could do. But what is true is he was treating between 70 and 80 people a day Whoa. off of two beds. Really? And this was, yeah, through the 60s, 70s, and he died in 1982. Um, and he was self-taught. He was a massage therapist, but sort of evolved through the years and uh, he treat, treated all sorts of health complaints uh you know he had a special saturday clinic for cerebral palsy uh children um and uh yeah so you know he developed a system he taught six guys his work uh or six main guys and so through the years that system has been taught worldwide it's not very it's not very big they're bone therapists in the uk um they it's a very small body in south africa um, it's obviously a lot bigger in Australia where, you know, where it's come from. 
Uh, but everywhere, Croatia, you know, Bulgaria, the States, uh, they're, they're bone therapists all over. And it's really just a, it's a soft tissue approach to sort of neural and mechanical dysfunction. Mm. So we work um, primarily with the fascia of the body or the connective tissue. And um, it's very, uh, it's not too forceful. So it's not painful. Sometimes it is, uh, mm. but it shouldn't be. Um, and it's really, you know, what kind of not separates it because the therapeutic pause is an osteopathic principle, but the treatment is punctuated by these pauses where we actually allow the nervous system some time to respond. It's a process called interoception. Mm -hmm. So we stimulate the body and then we wait for an internal response from the nervous system. What and would it look that like in, the response? How do you know it's responding? So generally, generally there's a change in neural uh, tension. So the muscle will soften, the fascia, the connective tissue will you'll soften. You'll come back and feel it softened or something like that. Definitely, yeah. Um, some people, depending on what's going on, will actually, you know, some people sort of shake in a particular way. There's a very small percentage of people. It, it's not popular in my clinic, but in some parts of the world, it's a big part of it. Um, you know, I've had people sort of have some emotional release on the table. Sure. Uh, so they become very teary, mm -hmm. um, you know, those types of things. Some people will say it feels like I've got a bit of heat in this area, you know, these types of things, or the pain is amplified sometimes mm -hmm. in a very small portion of cases. Yeah. But generally, you know, the, the more you, the more you have your hands on bodies, the more you can actually just feel the, 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 neu the neural and neural change within the tissue. So, um, and that's, you know, people, people will sort of symptoms will start to disappear. So, um, yeah, you know, there's, there's different responses for different people, I guess. So this just made me think about something, um, <clears throat> because obviously touch is powerful. hundred percent. But you, as a, as the practitioner, you mm. are touching a lot of people's bodies. It, does that have an effect on you physically or spiritually? Or what is it? Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, if you look at sort of uh, quantum physics and we talk yeah. about quantum entanglement, yeah. um, then definitely, definitely, without a doubt, um, there are more, um, there are a lot of practitioners in all different modalities, not necessarily Bowen therapy that have different rituals. So whether it's grounding and using oils and spraying themselves and, you know, there, there's different things that people use to stop that. Okay. okay. Stop um, the transfer maybe or like the... Yeah, to cl cleanse themselves. Because obviously the moment you're touching, there's an interaction, right? You, you can't help it. There's an interaction. Um, you know, well, well, I asked that same question to one of my mentors and he just looked at me and went, doesn't bug me. Really? So, yeah, so I've, I've, you know, it's kind of what I've adopted. Uh, look, there are days, um, you know, when people will come in and tell you the most horrific stories of um, abuse and they've never told anyone, as an example. And I leave clinic and I can feel like, oh, you know. You feel heavy. I, I can feel it. It's, it's heavy. Like it's, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I think anyone in that situation would feel heavy even if you were just having that conversation you with someone, touched right? yeah yeah for sure so uh you know uh, red wine is good for that uh earthing is good for that um <laughs> exercise is good for that yeah, so um yeah. yeah yeah for sure you you need you know also just my rugby background i battle with my neck and jaw being in the front row years mm. of sort of impact on the back of my neck and then I'm in clinic, I'm bent over all day, over a bed, right? Fixing other people. So I, I develop these like little niggles myself, you know? Mm. Um, so you need some sort of physical practice to, to release that. Otherwise, you know, fascia, which is really what is what gives you your posture, has a half life of about 560 odd days. So every 18 months, your fascial network is completely regenerated. Really? All um, the cells are renewed within the That's right. So in the fascial network. So, you know, every, I'm not sure if you know, but every 24 hours you have a completely new eyeball. Every 24 hours your eye cells are, it regenerates that quickly. Yeah. So, uh, six weeks, six weeks, you've got a new liver, uh, seven years, you've got a complete new skeletal system. So you, you're connected. a new person every seven years. Every seven years. Physically. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Physically. And you know, you should be mentally as well. Yeah. 
Um, so the, the, the interesting thing about fascia is how uh, forces, it, it adjusts itself to force. So okay. if you sit for long periods, your hip flexor shorten, the psoas will shorten, your lower back will tighten. And if you continue that pattern day after day after day, yeah. you eventually develop lower back pain, shortened hamstrings, yeah. and that leads to other issues in the body. You know, as, as an example, if you're a runner, a cyclist, a rugby player, or a yogi, the fascia would all mold differently to those forces. And so sometimes the adaptation is dysfunctional. And so you need, you need to, um, you know, create a practice that, that breaks that down. Counteracts it in a way. Yeah. hundred percent. That just reminds me of this program I watched about these um, guys who used to, this is like back in Anglo-Saxon and UK, you know, they used to like pull these bow and arrows and have swords and they showed that their skeleton was a lot stronger around here as compared to what ours were. So that must have been yeah. like just years of just using that movement has made their body structure just change. Amazing. For sure. If, if you, you know, you look at, um, I always use this example, uh, Muay Thai. So, t you know, uh, kickboxers in Thailand. Okay. Those little, those little young guys, you know, they start when they, three or four, uh, they start training. And they just whip their shins with, uh, you know, sticks mm. and stuff. To, to sort of harden the bone and deaden the nerves there. And I mean, that you'd think like, that's crazy, but the body goes hard in that position. It's adapting itself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you, you quite an active guy. I'm sure you've heard of uh, weight training being really beneficial for women specific, men and women, but women specifically to prevent osteoporosis because as long as the bones are feeling that pressure and tension, they, um, they remain strong, you know? And it's, it's pretty much what you mentioned earlier with regards to as long as we keep moving and we're looking after ourselves, we, our aging process should slow. You know, we should, we should have a better quality of life as we get older. Yeah. It reminds me also of um, just going on to the last few things here, Sean, this being yeah, great talking yeah. to you. And, and I was just thinking about two things, particularly um, the vagus nerve, which is uh, this nerve down here. I'm sure you know about it where you can be trained, I do. you know, uh, maybe like a cold shower on the head or something. Yes. Like that. Yes. And then thinking about um, small, short bouts of uh, exposing yourself to stresses. And then, like you mentioned earlier, we were saying we had these like, we used to have these like short bursts of, ex of, of stress and then it was relaxed again, which makes yeah. sense, right? But now we can't just constantly be under stress the whole time. But uh, what I try and do, um, I've been doing it for almost two years now, is having a cold shower. I don't, I don't always jump into the cold shower first. I'll sometimes I have a warm shower and then I'll switch it to cold, sure. maybe back to hot, yeah. back to cold. So that's giving my body that kind of like, you know, bit of, bit of stress yes. at the time. So is because I'm thinking about the central nervous system, it seems so um, vital in our functionality that um, anything mm. we can do to train it or at least stimulate it uh, is good. Yeah. Is that true? hundred yeah. percent. Uh, again, you know, if, uh, if we, uh, so I use this example in the talk I give, you know, mm -hmm. you and I are talking, I presume you're on a, a laptop or a, a computer. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, you could probably do this. I think if you're an RT, if you strip the computer apart into its component parts yeah. and then put it back together and flip the switch, it will turn back on. You know, yeah. the computer should work. Yeah. If I took a human being and I did that uh. and I put him back together, it's not going to turn back on, right? It's not going to work. So um, there's something very different about who we are fundamentally. And we, we are sort of a bio entity and we are trying to force it to be a machine, to be work in a mechanical nature. And it's not, it's not designed for that. Within us is some life force, something that separates us from a machine. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 you know, whether you're, you can call it Brahman, you can call it Allah, you can call it, Holy Ghost. If you're a quantum theorist, you'd call it unified field. If you're a Jedi, you'd call it the force. Okay. There, there is, whatever you call it. There's, yeah, whatever you call it. <laughs> there's an energy that permeates life. Sure. And the, the energy expresses itself through you. It needs a nervous system to do that. Hmm. So the energy expression is determined by the information in the environment, internally and externally. So hmm. if, if, for example, that my nervous system is taking in negative stuff, you know, processed food, not enough sunlight. I'm not getting enough sleep. I'm not exercising enough. 
True. My health expression yeah. is not great. That, that force, that force expression isn't great. Mm. And so if I do the opposite and I earth and I eat a healthy diet and I exercise and I meditate and breathe and expose myself, cold exposure, um, you know, I limit uh, processed foods. I don't smoke. I limit alcohol. All of these things give me a positive uh, health expression because my nervous system interprets positive information. I get a positive health expression. Mm. So without a doubt, and this is the big thing that people don't realize. Um, you know, we sort of conditioned by society that oh, this is how life is, mm. but we are living completely outside of how we should be living. Mm. And then we wonder why we have these health complications, why we have, you know, cancers and depression and anxiety and, uh, you know, stress diseases, modern health and lifestyle mm. diseases. Um, it's simply because, the, the stimulus that we are giving our nervous system isn't a good one. It's not beneficial to a 200,000 year old nervous system. Mm. So it's, it's almost like this last, I don't know, hundred, 200, maybe, maybe a thousand yep. years or less is that we're trying to, cause I suppose since the industrial age, maybe. I yes. Suppose I, more... so, so I'd say about 1860, that's when our problem started. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that was the industrial, industrial that's, revolution. It's almost like that movie. I just started watching, although it was a bit hard to watch called the current war. And it talks, of, uh, I didn't know Thomas Edison was such a knob, but you, like I thought, oh, he's a nice guy. But then the film yeah. this, this, the, shows him as this real idiot. So you're like, Oh God, I no time for that guy. Um, but, uh, the, one of the lines in the movie was, um, Edison has, is going to, what was the word? Take away the night or something like that. Okay. And, and the idea is that he's creating light so that yeah. when the sun goes down, there's no longer dark. Now we can have light whenever we want light. And we're kind of creating this environment that we are just so not used to. And even though we've only been alive in this age, sure. you know, us, I mean, we're 40 years old, I don't know how old you are, but you know, we don't know about that, 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 that environment, but we, we, no. know, we know maybe mentally what that environment is. What could it be like? But we, I suppose we can, to some degree, recreate, uh, recreate some of that environment as best we can. I think lockdown gave us a few people a good opportunity to think about, uh, let's go for more walks. People have been saying to me in this, in this area, you know, I've been living here 10, 20 years and I never knew about that park down the road or that walk in that forest. And so people have, to some degree, experimented a bit more. Sure. I don't know how it has yeah. been in South Africa. 100%. There definitely has been a, a reset. So, you know, I, I come from this rugby background where I've always lifted weights. You know, that was my, my thing. And I've, I've taken up running. And, you know, if you go out running in the trails, if you're not out by half past five, six in the morning, it's literally, you're like in a shopping mall. There are oh, so really? many people out hiking, walking, and you know, they were never there before. So... Cool. There is, there is definitely some change in the collective consciousness where hopefully people realize, you know, we were, we were sort of on a trajectory that isn't sustainable and sure. we, we need to start making, um, you know, choices. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite quotes is from Mother Teresa. She said, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to uh, change the world, go home and love your family, sweep your own step, basically. Sure. And that is if, if we had you know, or we're really, we're on a planet with 8 billion people that like it's just not sustainable. Mm. Um, if, if all of those 8 billion people just changed their habits, the world would change completely, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it's almost like we, we need permission to change and we don't actually, mm -hmm. it's just a simple choice, you know, mood follows action, make the choice. You'll never think yourself out of a particular mind state. You need to just take action. And whether that's a cold shower going for a walk, changing a diet, going for a run, turning the TV off, turning devices off. Um, you know, you'll be amazed at how those small actions can actually create massive positive change for you. Excellent. I love that. Sean, mm. that's, that's brilliant. And uh, it's been so good talking to you about these things. It really excites me to, to think about that and um, the change that we can make. I think we just got to stop being um, maybe influenced by those influences that we shouldn't be influenced by, you know, like of course, bad media or at least commercialism or whatever it may be. So thanks for pointing sure. that out. It's been great. No. So okay. Sean, if people um, are listening in South Africa and they in the Joburg area, I think you are. 
I am, yeah. Yeah, so where, whereabouts? Is it Ramberg or somewhere close? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in Randburg, uh, Rand Park Ridge specifically. I'm at the Ridge Wellness Center. Yeah. Um, all my details are on my website, structuralmedicine.co.za. And, uh, you know, I'm on the social media avenues. So Instagram, Facebook, it's all Sean Johnson underscore structural medicine, but it should pop up. Yeah. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. And, uh, yeah, we can, if anyone wants to reach out. Yeah. Are you busy? We can chat. You'd be pretty. Uh, it, it, hey, with the waiting waiting. List. <laughs> well, it's got obviously with COVID, you know, being a, a sort of touch and hands on modality, oh, yeah. uh, it's a little bit slower than it has been, sure. but, um, look, it's, I can't complain. A lot of people have closed. Mm. Uh, I've, I've managed to, to stay open. I've got uh, a really loyal client base who see value in what I do sure. um, and, uh, and the benefit of what I do. And so, um, yeah, you know, uh, on my pages, you can book an appointment online so you can yeah. just see what's available if you need, if you're battling with anything. Um, or even if you just, you know, my, my cell phone's there, people can get in touch and we can mm. chat whether I can help or can't help. But I'm happy to have a go at anything. For sure, man. And I think after yeah. people hear about what you do, they're definitely going to find, you know, and especially for people like myself who are into, in a, in a way, biohacking. I'm not a proper biohacker. Mm. But, but, no, I get it, what you're saying. Yeah. So just into like longevity, that's my thing, right? That mm. I think people should, can realize that what you do is actually good for longevity as well. And I think, you know, if I was around there, I'd, I'd definitely come. But I'm going to look for some structural medicine person around here and see see what we can get going. I'll 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 send you some. Are you in London? Or I'm close. I'm about an hour and a half from London. So yeah. Okay. So I'll uh, we can chat off, and I'll send you some names of people that are kind of close. We go see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hang on the line. We'll t we'll talk in a minute. But Sean, it's been sure, so great sure. uh, talking to you on Live Shot from me, Clint Grove, on Live Shot podcast, and Sean Johnson. Have a good day.